They tend to have, remember at the beginning that I explained, paradoxical uh, poles. Uh, they tend to also have that, also alternance. Uh, that is uh, prevalent in patients that have pericarditis or cardiac tamponade or pericardial effusion or pulmonary embolism, for example. Pericarditis could also be a complication of uh, uh, coronary artery bypass graft. When you do an open heart surgery, you manipulate the pericardium. That can uh, not only introduce uh, 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 infectious process, but also produce an inflammatory reaction of the pericardium. And when the patients are discharged, they basically come back again with chest pain, which is mostly pleuritic, descriptic of pericarditis, and that syndrome is called Dressler syndrome. Other uh, um, uh, processes or uh, inflammatory reactions that can produce pericarditis, I explain about renal failure and how much the urea accumulation can produce uh, a uremia and therefore pericarditis, but also uh, medications that are highly irritative, uh, that they do have a very narrow, spe narrow spectrum, such as phenytoin and prokinamide or hydralazine, can also produce uh, pericarditis. Uh, etiologies, as I told you, most commonly is inflammatory in nature, uh, but infectious processes can produce this, as I explained. Highly common in patients with renal failure, mostly end-stage renal disease, accumulation of urea can produce pericarditis. We mentioned a couple of samples of uh, medications, such as hydralazine, phenytoin, that can produce pericarditis. Any accumulation of fluid at the level of the serosa produced by hypothyroidism or any type of autoimmune condition can produce pericarditis such as lupus, hypothyroidism, sarcoidosis, scleroderma, amyloidosis. As uh, previously stated, if you have any type of regurgitation or leakage of fluid uh, at the level of the pericardium by an aortic dissection or any type of ovulopathy, uh, any type of trauma, any direct surgery, any radiation therapy, that can produce leakage of fluid at the level of the uh, uh, pericardium and produce pericarditis. And of course, the signs and symptoms associated with it, which again, is an inflammatory in nature. Patients can have fever, they can have chills, they can have shortness of breath, but the chest pain is highly typical. It's sharp, it's worse in inspiration and cough, it's worse when the patient's laying back and it's better when the patient's lean forward. EKG changes, as I told you, Highly prevalent is the widespread systemic elevation of the uh, uh, EKG all across, but patients sometimes they do have PR depression in multiple leaks as well. Uh, pericardial friction round, remember, that is highly prevalent with them. They tend to also have associated uh, myocardial infarction when it's very severe, when it's caught, when it's not caught on time, associated with severe bubbleopathies as well. So again, uh, you have a widespread ST systemic elevation, and this is no more than a representation of a J point that is elevated with an ST segment as well. And you could also have a concave up, but with the J point that is uh, elevated. T, high peaks, uh, that is also indicative of ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction. Um, of course, pericarditis could be highly present in adults, uh, highly common in men. Uh, any inflammatory process, any infectious process can give you pericarditis, including HIV and patients that have tuberculosis. But again, it's most commonly inflammatory in nature. It's how I described it, widespread elevation of the ST, even though sometimes it's only represented by PR, depression in multiple leads, uh, and it's highly treated based on the underlying etiology and giving anti-inflammatories, which are NSAIDs, uh, the number one. Uh, aortic dissection, uh, basically these patients have a, a tearing, uh, uh, um, very severe ripening in nature type of uh, chest pain, of abrupt onset. They have a pain that is sternal that is radiating to the back, interscapular between the shoulder, and is associated with 
hemodynamic instability. So the patients do have hypotension and flash pulmonary edema. This is a medical emergency. And how you can see it in a simple chest x-ray is by widening of the mediastinum, even though uh, CT scan of the chest and abdomen has to be uh, given to uh, 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 as a gold standard diagnostic evaluation. Unfortunately, many patients are diagnosed uh, through uh, autopsy. Uh, patients with Marfan syndrome, which is again a collagen for uh, um, autosomic recessive condition that the patients are born without it. Uh, patients tend to have uh, um, a repetitive uh, um, uh, pneumothoraxes and patients tend to have also rupture of the aortic uh, valve as well as uh, papillary muscles and di dissection uh, of the aorta. Highly common in patients with plant, uh, uh, male population and a uh, major risk factor is that unsustained or uncontrolled hypertension. The higher the pressure at the level of the vessel, the higher the possibilities of bulging and uh, rupture. Uh, so patients do have, of course, uh, uh, if this is a dissection of the thoracic or abdominal aorta, the perfusion of the lower extremities will be limited. So you would see that these patients have a different in pressure and pulse uh, in the upper comparing with the lower extremities. So higher pressure in the upper extremities compared to the lower extremities. Heart failure is another uh, differential diagnosis of chest pain. So basically aortic dissection, you have to give the patient large amount of fluids and bring the patient to the OR, control the uh, blood pressure and repair the dissection. Uh, uh, patients with heart failure, remember that you do have uh, left side of heart failure and right side of heart failure. Uh, the major trigger factor of uh, heart failure, since the most common is the left side of heart failure, is hypertension. So what happens is that uh, autoregulation by a uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system is disrupted and the patient goes into left ventricular remodeling, producing left ventricular hypertrophy and therefore failure of the left side of the heart before the right side of the heart fails. So basically this is no more than the, whenever there's a changes of volume or pressure uh, due to decreased cardiac output, most commonly present is systolic heart failure, there is an activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that pressure or volume is perceived by the beta receptors that, in addition to that, activate in the gastrocnemial apparatus the release of renin. Renin uh, will uh, activate angiotensin 1. Angiotensin converting enzyme will change angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 to produce the vasoconstriction. And if that does not improve volume or pressure, then aldosterone will reabsorb certain water and excrete potassium and ADH um, will uh, uh, reabsorb water to be able to bring volume and pressure uh, at the level uh, of the heart. Increasing preload and therefore due to auto regulatory response that increases after load by the action of angiotensin 2. Now what happens is that when the, when the cycle becomes vicious uh, remodeling is a negative factor because it produces a ventricular hypertrophy and failure and therefore patients will start having signs and symptoms of left side of heart failure which is no more than shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, orthopnea, parosysma, notumodipsia. Eventually of course the right side of the heart fails and then that's when you tend to have uh, signs and symptoms of core pulmonal which again is the jugular vein distension uh, GI, distress, nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Patients would have lower extremity edema, ascites. They tend to have hepatosplechnomegaly. So what happens is uh, uh, left side of heart failure is that in left side of heart failure, the ejection fraction and stroke volume is decreased. That compromises tissue hyperperfusion. That's the reason why these patients tend to have more commonly shortness of breath fatigue, uh, orthopnea, parasitism, dyspnea, associated with pulmonary edema, shortness of breath and crackles, versus right side of heart failure, what is impeded is diastolic uh, uh, function preload, and therefore patients would have JVD, uh, uh, lower extremity edema, ascites, and hepatosplechnomegaly. Other uh, non-ischemic uh, chest pain 
Um, look at, again, uh, echocardiogram, uh, pace that lasts a few seconds. Uh, uh, you look at the troponins, if you see no evidence of uh, troponin leakage, uh, of course, it could be completely angina related, but look at other disease processes as well. For example, let's talk about any type of pleurisy, so any inflammation to the pleura. We're going to go in detail of pneumonia in pulmonary conditions, but this is at glance. How can a pneumonic uh, uh, disease process can produce chest pain? Well, if you have any type of infectious process of any kind in the lung, that imitates the pleura. And when the patient is trying to breathe in and out, that produces a very sharp pain. And uh, it's associated with inspiration and cough, as I told you. Most of the time it tends to be unilateral. Patients can actually point at the area exactly where it hurts. And of course, the patients would have signs and symptoms of pneumonia, which is no more than fever, leukocytosis, productive cough, sometimes or not, associated with hemoptysis and uh, um, uh, rails as well. Um, basically, this is uh, statistics uh, uh, as the sixth leading uh, cause of death in patients that have uh, more than 65 years of age and uh, it's highly uh, prevalent uh, of hospitalization and economic burden uh, for the country as well. Pulmonary embolism is another condition that can give you sharp, pleuritic type of chest pain. Patients can also point exactly where it hurts. It's worse than inspiration on cough. It's associated with, many times, with core pulmonal or right bundle branch block that appears in the EKG. But this is sudden onset. It's sharp. It's pleuritic in nature. It's worse than inspiration and cough. And many times do have associated hemodynamic instability as well. Even though the patients could be completely asymptomatic with uh, pulmonary embolism. But if it hurts, again, it's pleuritic in nature. Could be or not associated with hemoptysis. Remember, any type of pressure at the level of the vascular uh, bed in the lung can produce pulmonary apoplexia and therefore bleeding. The most common symptom for pulmonary embolism is not chest pain, it's tachypnea. Uh, patients uh, complain of shortness of breath. Uh, they do have uh, uh, if it's present, the chest pain is pleuritic type, and sometimes it's associated with hemodynamic instability when produces a massive PE. Uh, trigger factors that can give you uh, chest pain related to pulmonary embolism, think about the virtual triad. So has the patient been hospitalized? Has the patient had surgery, any type of trauma, any type of fracture, any type of endothelial damage? Even sepsis can produce endothelial damage. Uh, will the patient have any type of hypercoagulable state? Do the patient have cancer? Do the patients uh, uh, have uh, a deficiency of protein S, C, or factor V ladies, or uh, antithrombin 3, or lupus anticoagulant that congenitally are predisposed to uh, coagulopathies? Autoimmune conditions, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, are highly prevalent for uh, uh, hypercoagulability activity. Patients that have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, uh, can also have hypercoagulability. So look at those factors that uh, pregnancy uh, patients that have, uh, for example, uh, uh, oral contraceptive pills uh, taking, uh, hormone replacement therapy. Those are factors that can indicate that the patient is at high risk for, high risk for thromboembolism. And also immobility. How are you at home? Are you active? Are you always sitting down? Uh, what do you work? What do you do for a living? Are you spending long hours sitting down? Or have you traveled outside the country long distance in an airplane or in a car that can predispose you to have a pulmonary embolism? A pneumothorax is another type of pleuritic type of chest pain that can give you sharp in nature. It's worse than inspiration of cough. Uh, it's associated with shortness of breath. Uh, it's sudden in nature. It's also unilateral. Okay? So basically it's a collapsed lung that can give you tachycardia, tachypnea, shortness of breath. And when you uh, are going to percuss the chest, we're going to see that in pulmonary, you see, you, you actually uh, hear, um, sorry, hear uh, tympani uh, instead of uh, uh, um, uh, dullness. That, um, so higher tympani uh, compared to the normal resonance uh, uh, sound that the patient should have. Um, 
In addition to that, decrease uh, or uh, abolish uh, breast sounds at the level of the pneumothorax. And also, when the patients have tension pneumothorax, since the mediastinum is shift to the contrary side, the preload is impeded, therefore the cardiac output is impeded, and the patients tend to have hemodynamically instability. Think about pneumothoraxes, even though this could be completely spontaneously uh, um, uh, on patients, for example, that have bullos, emphysema, uh, patients that have COPD, uh, or patients, for example, that have Marfan syndrome that congenitally have uh, insufficiency of collagen, or patients that are exposed to very loud uh, music environment or high noise. Uh, pneumothoraxes are also thought about traumatic procedures. Has a patient had a thoracentesis, for example, or any type of uh, uh, cardiac uh, related surgery, or has the patient uh, had any trauma? that is indicative to have a rib fracture and possibly a pneumothorax. Or if the patient is in mechanical ventilation, where the patient has a very high peak uh, pressure that can indicate that there's possible collapse lung. And basically you do a uh, chest x-ray to be able to uh, diagnose this. Sometimes it's so small that you have to do uh, a CT chest. And depending on the percentage of the patient you treat accordingly, less than 25%, high oxygen flow, more than 25%, you put a chest tube and reassess for expansion. And we're going to talk about treatment related in uh, pulmonary. So again, it's sudden onset, it's mostly unilateral, it's that sharp, it's also worse in inspiration and cough. Uh, patients have a high resonance compared to the normal resonance. If there is any type of tension, you have tracheal deviation, which is uh, very rare to uh, see, actually. Uh, we talked about the possibilities, uh, statistics-wise, of patients that have pneumothorax. What about gastrointestinal diseases, like gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is very, very highly prevalent in our community coming with chest pain. It's also retrosternal, could be epigastric. Patients do have a burning sensation. They tend to do this type of manifestation indicating that they do have reflux. Sometimes they feel that uh, they, uh, uh, they get like uh, bitter, sour uh, uh, um, taste in their mouth. Uh, mostly common at night when the patients are laying flat. Uh, patients are waking up with cough in the morning. Sometimes it's a highly prevalent disease that produces acute bronchospasm and wheezing in the morning. Uh, patients sometimes are hoarse in the morning due to the acidity irritating the larynx and the vocal cords. And also since the fume is going into the lung at night, patients do have aspiration pneumonias as well as bronchospasm. So look for that. Uh, worse when the patients eat, it's relieved by antiacids. Um, the same as uh, uh, esophageal spasm. So this is exactly the description that I just went through. Uh, pancreatitis, again, is an epigastric in nature. It's mostly boring. It's uh, radiating into the back. It's associated with nausea, vomiting, hypotension. This patient has a lot of uh, 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 leakage of uh, fluid. Uh, into the interstitial, they have a high deficit of fluid, so they're hypovolemic, they tend to be hypotensive, uh, but again, mostly uh, um, epigastric radiating into the back. Uh, peptic ulcer disease, remember that this is also epigastric in nature, it's burning, uh, it's actually alleviated by food and antiacids. Uh, gastritis, on the contrary, is worsening with food. Um, but it's mostly burning in nature that sometimes radiates into the sternum and can mimic uh, signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. So talk to your patient. Uh, cholecystitis could be another atypical presentation of acute coronary syndrome. These patients tend to have epigastric right over quadrant uh, uh, type of uh, chest pain, mostly uh, 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 dull in nature, uh, that could radiate to the scalp on the shoulder, so that's the reason why it mimics. Uh, it's actually diagnosed by uh, ultrasound uh, of the right upper quadrant. You could see the uh, uh, bulging or uh, slowing of the um, uh, emptying of the gallbladder, and uh, also it's associated with uh, uh, inflammatory markers of cell rate and CRP. Patients have leukocytosis and fever 
nausea and vomiting as well. And in later conditions, of course, they tend to have jaundice. Costochondral diseases like costochondritis, which is one of the most common. Uh, think about, again, moving activity, heavy weight, uh, lifting, uh, any type of trauma that can indicate, and again, don't forget the pregnant woman, highly, highly prevalent. So it could hurt anywhere, but it's mimic, it's reproduced when you are palpating the area. Movement exacerbates the uh, uh, pain. So it is highly reproduced, uh, it tends to be dull in nature. Um, another condition is the psychiatric disorder, so panic attack, anxiety. Unfortunately, it has to be done at the end, so this is basically by exclusion uh, criteria, uh, but 10% of patients that come into the hospital do present uh, panic attack. Uh, patients tend to hyperventilate, uh, they tend to have sharp type of pain that is prolonged in duration, so you cannot have an acute myocardial infarction an entire day or uh, several days. Um, so basically you could have, uh, uh, for example, a respiratory alkalosis when you do uh, 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 an ABG. Uh, you could also have the CO2 decreased uh, 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 when the patients are having, for example, a regular uh, BNP. You can also look at um, um, changes in uh, ST and T wave abnormalities produced by uh, alkalosis, you know, respiratory alkalosis, that changes in the EKG that could be present. Uh, but think about history, that if a patient has any type of depression or anxiety or panic attack, look at the family to see if you're able to uh, look at a pattern. Herpes zoster is another condition that can give you chest pain. This most likely is burning, it's sharp in nature. Uh, patients tend to uh, 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 describe that the pain, if it's intercostal in this case, is coming from the sternum area, high or low, and radiates to the back, uh, mostly burning. Unfortunately, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, many times we miss the vesicular rash, otherwise it would be very, very easy. Um, sometimes when the patients do have any type of uh, herniated disc at the level of the cervical spine, uh, tends to radiate at the level of the uh, center of the chest or in the back, that could be mimicking acute coronary syndrome. Uh, that is uh, basically patients that have any type of, again, uh, cervical spine injury or any bulging or any flattening of the disc or narrowing of the disc that is uh, 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 pinching on the uh, cervical nerve or patients for example that have any type of bursitis that can uh, have uh, shoulder pain that you could be uh, misinterpreting as acute coronary syndrome. So again the goal is to be able to rule out first uh, disease process that can kill the patient which are pulmonary conditions as well as cardiovascular conditions and then you can think about the rest. So again look at disease process that can be emergently treated. Would the patient have an acute coronary syndrome, any type of aortic dissection, pulmonary emboli or pneumothorax. Again, we went through the description of acute heart disease. Look at your ponies to be able to differentiate between stable, stable versus myocardial infarction. If it's present, bring the patient emergently to the cardiac cath. Aortic dissection, mostly you look at the ripening severe associated with hemodynamic instability has to go to the OR. Pulmonary embolism is sharp in nature, is pleuritic, worsening inspiration on cough associated with cough, shortness of breath, sometimes hemoptysis, or completely asymptomatic. But if the chest pain is present, it's mostly pleuritic in nature. And we're gonna talk about treatment of pulmonary embolism and diagnosis of it in pulmonary. Pneumothorax is sudden, it's spontaneous, it's unilateral. Uh, even though it could be spontaneous, uh, it could be also traumatic related. So look at the history, would the patient be on high peak? The patient is any motor vehicle accident that maybe fractures could do that. Has the patient had any type of thoracentesis yesterday that can, prov can provoke that? Is the patient having a history of any type of bulls and pisima? Because it was my patient from the office before and I know that. So any type of past medical history or uh, causative factors that can make you think about uh, uh, pneumothorax. And in pulmonary embolism, look at the risk factors, the pulmonary uh, uh, or the vitro triad, 
Okay? So if not, could this be due by any other specific disease? Is it due by pericarditis, sharp, worse than inspiration on cough, is worse when laying back, is better when leaning forward, widespread elevation of the EKG, pneumonia, would the patient have fever, leukocytosis, productive cough, do I do a chest x-ray and I see the actual infectious process, do I have burning sensation that is running through the dermatome distribution, if I do have the vesicular rash, it's even better. So. Otherwise, if not, could this be due to chronic conditions that could cause serious uh, 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 or potential complications as well, such as, for example, aerotexanosis or pulmonary hypertension that we discussed already, stable angina, aerotexanosis. And pulmonary hypertension basically could be due to an acute onset of pulmonary embolism that already gave a pulmonary infarction or chronic pulmonary diseases such as bronchiectasis or patients that have uh, uh, COPD or pulmonary fibrosis that chronically have increased the uh, pressure at the level of the lung and they have produced right side heart failure or corp pulmonal as a complication. Assess the hemodynamic instability of the patient. Is the patient stable that can wait for me to do the entire diagnostic process or is the patient hemodynamically unstable that I have to, for example, revise this patient in the OR if I think that this is a possibility of a rupture uh, or dissection of the aorta. Uh, go through HMP and all the laboratory evaluation to try to rule down. Go through cardiac and pulmonary causes first and then the rest. Do an EKG, do troponins, do a chest x-ray, do an echocardiogram to be able to rule out all the diseases, okay? Uh, for example, um, you know that you need to do a cardiac set uh, because the initial troponins are not all the time elevated. So you could have a normal troponin and a normal EKG and still have a non-systemic elevation myocardial infarction that you can miss. Or compare the EKG. Have you seen any major changes of the EKG that makes you think that the patient is having any type of ischemic changes? If EKG is completely normal, no troponin is elevated, but the patient has the typical signs and symptoms of angina, well, you still have time to um, put the patient on aspirin, morphine, nitroglycerin, put dual antiplatelet therapy and high dose statin as well as heparin, and coordinate uh, uh, care with the cardiologist to either bring this patient into a stress test or to uh, do uh, a cardiac cath as well. Uh, don't forget about to the echocardiogram to see what would be the etiological factor or complication associated with this. We talked about stable angina that is worse in exertion and is relieved by rest. Um, so there are many, many diseases that do not require hospitalization, but unfortunately, once the patient seeks uh, medical attention in the ER, you have to rule out the um, uh, uh, medical emergencies first before you end up with, for example, gastrointestinal causes that then you bring the GI to do an endoscopy uh, or uh, bring emotional support with psychiatrist if you believe that this is related to anxiety. Uh, again, remember, if the patient is in the ER, don't forget about your cardiac enzymes, even though troponin set is more than sufficient. Remember that creatinine kinase uh, myoglobins are released by any other type of muscle damage, uh, not necessarily by cardiac, but any skeletal and smooth. Uh, do a rapid base size evaluation. You could do a uh, uh, point of care troponin uh, that doesn't have to be sent to the laboratory to have an idea uh, of what to do. Uh, remember that um, EKG and troponins are highly sensitive uh, and specific for um, uh, myocardial infarction, and uh, two negative tests uh, uh, more than six hours apart are useful for excluding myocardial necrosis. Um, again, what else can you do? Uh, you could do C-reactive protein, you could do Surray, for example, they're highly elevated in patients that have pericarditis. You could do BMP. Remember that uh, brain or atrial nodulated peptide are released when there's high, any high stretching of the ventricular wall. So yes, it could be present in patients that have myocardial infarction, it could be present in patients that have volume of real estate, but it could also be present in patients that have pulmonary embolism. D-dimer, 
Uh, remember, there's also a sensitive factor. It's just saying that the inflammatory cascade has activated the coagulation cascade. Only tells you that there's a high possibility of a thrombombolic event, but it's not a specific factor. We're going to discuss in pulmonary how to diagnose and treat uh, pulmonary embolism. Other images, uh, for example, you could do a chest x-ray if you're thinking about uh, uh, pleural effusion that is irritating the pleura, or pneumonia or TB that is irritating the pleura, or you can see a pneumothorax in a simple x-ray. Remember to do a uh, uh, chest x-ray that can be seen as widening of the mediastinum, or a CT chest or abdomen to rule out aortic dissection. Uh, you can also do, for example, um, MRI of the heart, uh, uh, you could do a transesophageal or transthoracic echocardiogram to rule out any kind of disease process cardiovascular that can lead to uh, chest pain. Um, any other provocative test, as I told you, you could do take the patient to the stress test if this patient has stable or unstable angina or not in systemic elevation myocardial infarction. Otherwise, bring the patient to the cardiac cath for percutary coronary intervention with or without stent placement. Uh, for patients that do have ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, for acute uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, low sensitive tests, uh, patients uh, could have ventilation perfusion scan when they cannot take iodine because they have allergies or when they have renal insufficiency. Otherwise, CT angiogram of the chest is the gold standard evaluation. EKG, you can do diagnose so many disease with EKG. Uh, for example, with an EKG, if you have an ST elevation, myocardial infarction is highly indicative of LMI. Uh, but widespread, for example, is indicative of pericarditis. Uh, patients that do have an ST depression is a sign of ischemia that could be present in non-systemic elevation, myocardial infarction, or stable or unstable angina. Uh, look at the prior EKG to be able to compare. Is this having any change or the patient has been having the same thing at the same time. In addition, if you have a baseline and you give a nitroglycerin and the ischemic changes change, it's highly indicative that the patient is going through acute uh, coronary syndrome. Uh, treatment related, again, really depends on the uh, disease process. We talked about acute uh, myocardial infarction. If the patient has a non-systemic elevation myocardial infarction, the patient must be on aspirin, uh, uh, um, dual antiplatelet therapy combined with Plavix or Brilinta. The patient must be on heparin drip. The patient must be on nitroglycerin. And remember, once the acute disease process passes, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and high dose statin um, uh, to be able to uh, discharge the patient. Uh, for all stable angina, uh, uh, the same you have to do the, the, the Mona, uh, uh, bring the patient to stress test or cardiac cath. Uh, for ST systemic elevation myocardial infarction, the same protocol, but if you have the patient in a uh, cardiac cath uh, available facility, bring it as soon as possible for percutaneous coronary intervention. For pulmonary embolism, if there is no contraindication, you would see that if you have massive PE and the patient can have uh, TPA, you give TPA. If otherwise uh, the patient has so massive, uh, or uh, uh, no alterations of cardiac function due to PE, you give anticoagulants, heparin, or lovinox, and then you bridge uh, to uh, uh, outpatient anticoagulant. Uh, aortic dissection, uh, bring the patient back to hemodynamic stability with fluids and OR for uh, repair. So basically you need to continue monitoring this patient. Uh, not just treat and let the patient go. Look for the underlying causes that is uh, producing chest pain. Refer to the specialties and always look at the risk factors and try to prevent uh, the, next, the next episode. And this will be the end of this presentation.